Okay. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Jones. I'm with the University of Arizona, Gila County Cooperative Extension. And this is uh, first in a series that I'm putting together that we're um, doing our work from home, stay from home world now. And I'm um, very happy to be introducing our speaker and just got a few slides here to go through before we start. So as you know, however you found out about this, um, we're gonna be talking about compost. Uh, so, so what is this all about? What I've, what I've got here planned is a weekly Zoom webinar. It'll be 60 minutes or less. Today we're gonna to find out exactly how long it takes. It will be Thursdays at 11. And um, as the county extension agent, I do programs dealing with horticulture and natural resources. So the topics that I've got lined up are gonna be relevant to our environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County. Um, that doesn't mean that it, it wouldn't be of interest to people outside of Gila County, but it's certainly you know, my interest and in what I'm gonna be trying to do with this throughout the summer. Um, recordings will be posted at the website seen there. That's our uh, extension website for the county. And just add this disclaimer here that the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity affirmative action institution. Here's our agenda. Um, those of you who have joined us, we've had our login and lag time. I'm doing the uh, moderation. I'm doing the welcome right now as the moderator. Here in a moment or two, we're going to have Fritz Johnson start up and talk about making compost in the traditional method. Um, we'll have an opportunity for some updates. I'll show you uh, the evaluation link. I really encourage you to participate with that. It'll give me information on what I can do to, to increase interest and, and just speakers that would have available to go forward with. Um, a Q question and answer uh, session or discussion with Rich and myself. We can talk about composting and gardening, natural resource stuff as, as, you know, as appropriate. Um, any opportunity for some open discussion and then we'll wrap up the discussion definitely by noon and, and even before if we've been if we're, if, if we're done. Um, a little bit about our speaker. Um, Rich Johnson is an Arizona organic gardener and a compost maker for the past 20 years. Um, he was in Tucson uh, and moved up to the Payson area three or four, two, I don't know, two years ago, however it was, got into my, my uh, master gardener class and really became a real force for getting the Master Gardener program and um, meetings together up in Payson over the past year. So thank you, Rich. Um, and at this point, I'm going to give the screen over to um, Rich. Rich, you're already a um, co-host, so you should be able to just grab that share screen and bring it up. Okay, um, can you hear me okay there? Um, we don't see your screen. Okay. Maybe I need to get out of what I have here. <clears throat> and if you're having difficulty, I can bring up my slide, the, the one I have. All right, stand by. I think I just need to I just need to hit the thing at the bottom where it says share screen here. Now I should be okay. Yeah. That look better? Perfect. Okay, good. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I, I came to Arizona after having lived in the East for most of my life. And I got hooked up with the Tucson Organic Gardeners. And they're the ones who taught me to compost in the desert. And of course, it's quite a different world from composting in the East. And they also taught me to, to compost. The gardening 
and stuff in the composting process. So what we're going to talk about today is how to make a batch of compost quickly. Anybody can make a batch of compost, but the time frame is what uh, makes the difference. So we're going to, I'm going to teach you here today how to do it in three months. And that's what a typical batch of compost should take you. So that's what we're going to get started on here. So let's uh, kind of, I just want to say, uh, ask you, have you ever, does this, sound, does this sound familiar to you? Someone you're talking to says, yeah, I tried composting once. You know, I took some banana peels and some carrot tops and some eggshells and I threw it in a bin or a bucket or a hole in the ground. And I came back, you know, three weeks later and took a look at it. And it was all a bit drier, but it was 100% identifiable. You know, the carrot tops and the banana peels, you know, composting just doesn't work. Well, I can tell you if you approach composting that way, it's not going to work for you. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, what it takes to, to actually make it work. So we'll start kind of at the beginning. And, and why is it we want to compost at all in the first place? That's some very obvious and, and, you know, intuitive kind of things. You get to recycle a lot of the waste back into the soil. So you get to use some of your yard trimmings and, and kitchen waste and things like that, and you get to recycle it and actually use it, make it do some good for your soil. It reduces methane production. In a landfill, the, the process that goes on there, whether they try to do it or not, is, a, is an anaerobic composting thing, and that generates methane, which is not so good for our environment. Compost makes a, a fertilizer that will do great things for your plants, and it does a lot more than just giving you the NPK. That's the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's all you really get with a chemical fertilizer. With, a, with compost, you get NPK, but you also get all the micronutrients and microbes that are going to make things uh, really work well in your garden for you. Compost can also be used as a mulch. And, it, and compost provides a habitat for the microbes. Microbes are what make the compost happen. Without the microbes, you don't get compost and you don't get a good garden. You must have a good microorganism climate going on in there, a whole ecosystem that goes on in your soil. Without that, your plants are not going to do well at all. And finished compost also makes the base for compost tea. Now, we're not going to really talk about compost tea today, but I just want you to be aware that that's one of the things that you can do with it. So, going to the next step there. Um, we're going to kind of put in perspective something about those microorganisms. Not enough good things can be said about microbes because they, as I said, are what make, makes the whole thing work for you. In one teaspoon of soil, you have over a billion bacteria, and that's comprised of somewhere between 20 and 30,000 different species of bacteria. And each one of those species has its own function in the composting process. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a while. There'll also be several yards of fungal hypha. Those are little, little uh, hair-like structures that are gonna be woven through your soil and it's somewhat akin to you know, opening your refrigerator and pulling last month's lasagna that got lost in the back of your refrigerator there, you know, and you open it up and it's turned into this week's science project. You know, all that fuzzy little hair stuff you see? Well, that fuzzy stuff is very similar to what the, the fungal hypha are, except that they're, the, with the fungus doing it, it's doing it on a nano scale. I mean, it's really small. And then you're also going to have thousands of protozoa in there. Those are those single-celled animals that you learned about back in, in junior high school science class, you know. So we're talking about paramecium's and amoebas and things like that. And there'll also be a few dozen beneficial nematodes. So those are some of the great things that go on uh, and are in uh, the benefits of composting and stuff that's in the compost and what's going to ultimately end up in your soil. So some of the benefits of using the compost is one of the biggest ones is that it lightens the soil. You need to do that because by lightening the soil, it creates all these micro spaces for water and air. And again, if I haven't said it already, th this composting process with all these microbes 
This is an aerobic process. This is not anaerobic. So all those critters need the water and air. They live in water and they need air to survive. So just remember now that, the, that an ideal soil is made up of 45% minerals, 5% organic matter, 25% water, and 25% air. That means that half of your soil isn't even solid material. It's water and air. That's how important that is for the microbes. Your job as a composter and as a gardener is to create the absolute best possible environment for the microbes that you possibly can because they're what make it happen. They are the, they're the real workhorses of this whole thing. Compost also increases water retention in the soil. Compost can hold as much as five times its own weight in water. Very good at, uh, at holding that. And it also provides an extremely good habitat for the microbiology. Have I mentioned the microbes yet? Okay, so we're gonna get down to actually figuring out how to do this whole composting process and what goes into it. I'm gonna share with you a few, a few tips that are essential to making a batch of compost in three months time. Okay, number one, you need to know what the ingredients are. And there are five important ingredients to compost. Number one are your brown materials. So this is, this is anything that was once a plant and is now dead and dry. So we're talking dead, dry leaves, shredded newspaper, dry grass, shredded cardboard. And some exceptions to that is you don't really want to use oleander leaves, eucalyptus leaves, or tamarisk. Those are kind of nasty items. And incidentally, the, the brown material, that's synonymous with high carbon material. And this is what provides the energy for the, for the microbes. This is what gives them their energy. The nutrition, now we're on to the greens. So we're talking green leaves, veggie scraps, stuff out of your kitchen, manure from vegetarian animals. Now, so when we're talking about that, we're talking about cows and horses and, and sheep and goats and even llamas. Manure, I've had my absolute best luck composting with manure. And speaking of luck, there are many kinds of luck in this world. There's good luck, there's bad luck, dumb luck, luck of the Irish. But what kind of luck does a successful composter have? Rotten luck. So we're also, we're also included in this, under the greens, we're looking at green grass. So in the browns, you can use dry grass, but under the greens, if you have green grass, that's an excellent compost material. It, it heats up very well. The bugs really like that. And you can also use weeds that have not gone to seed. Very important little distinction there. Additional ingredients, number three is water. As I mentioned before, the microbes live in water. They have to have water. They also have to have air because they're aerobic bugs. And the fifth item is volume, which is not really an ingredient itself. But if you, if you follow all the tips that I share with you here today, and you try to do it in a five gallon bucket, you're not going to have the success that you're looking for. You'll eventually end up with compost, but you will not get it in three months time. So you really need volume. Volume is very important. I typically, to give you some sense of what you need, is something in the order of about a 55 gallon drum. I have successfully composted in, a, in a, a bin that was about two feet by two feet by two or two and a half feet, something like that. But that's, that's pretty much pretty close to the minimum of what you need. And then the next tip about the whole process of building the pile is you need to know what the ratio of browns to greens needs to be. And this is really going to depend on your inputs. Your inputs are important here. And every time, what you'll find is that every time you change one of your primary inputs, you're going to end up with a different ratio. When I was, uh, composting, okay, in Tucson, when I was composting in Tucson, I found that I was, I was using sheep manure. And I found that I had to use about three parts brown to one part green to be successful with that. Now that I moved to Payson, what I found uh, available to me in bulk is horse manure. And I had to change my ratio closer to one to one because that's just what worked. So you know, again, you just sort of have to play with a little bit depending on what your inputs are, what your browns and your greens are. And, and you just do it by trial and error. But again, 
just the, the worst thing that can happen is that the process will take you a little longer than three months. And so that's, that's about the worst it can get. It'll eventually happen. So getting on to actually making the pile, you need to, we need to talk about tools very briefly. There's a 55 gallon drum sitting there. That is the drum that I did my first four batches of compost in. My first year of composting, that was what I did it in. Uh, and that works really well, but it is not the most user friendly thing. And at the time, all I had was the garden fork, which is the tool on the right there. That's really uncomfortable to use in a 55 gallon drum. I mean, you can get it done, I did it, but I wouldn't do it again. I mean, it's just, it was just not much fun at all. The tool on the left is called a compost crank. And that thing is available online. It's made by a family in Tucson. It was invented by a family in Tucson. And you'll notice at the top, it's got two handles there that allow you to, to treat it like a you know, hand drill. And at the bottom, it has a corkscrew thing on it. And that's uh, the way you use this tool is you literally drill it down into the compost and go down as far as you want and you pull straight up. You don't drill it up, you just pull up. And you will pull in that corkscrew stuff from the bottom to the top. When I first saw one of those things, I figured there's no way that thing's going to work very well. It is an excellent tool. I've used it many times and it's, it's a wonderful tool to use. Okay, so let's actually talk about a little bit about assembling the pile. Here I was collecting a bunch of greens. I had a, a, a bumper crop of sweet potatoes one year and the vine took over my entire backyard just about. And so I had to figure out what to do with all that vine. So, oh, well, it's time for a batch of compost. So you just pull all the, all the leaves off and you start shredding things up a little bit. You don't have to get too carried away with it. Just tear it up a little bit, break up the vines, and, and that's really all that needs to be done. This is not rocket science. Things are very, very rough and crude here. You just, just make it a little bit easier for the bugs to get started on eating the stuff. So by giving it the open edges, that'll do that. And you're gonna need a bunch of browns. So typically here in Payson, I found that, you know, I, I, I'm gonna do my composting in the spring and summer because the cold weather of the winter really slows the process down. So you're gonna be doing it really in the summertime. So that means you're gonna to need to be saving leaves from the fall or, or over the winter. So have some leaves on hand. You're gonna to need to collect them in that fall winter time frame and just hang on to them. And then you're gonna to wanna to have all your stuff together at one time so that on day one, you're ready to go with everything you need to fill your compost bin. Now I'm gonna be walking through two different um, makings here, if you will. We're going to make one pile inside that center bin there. That is recycled pallets. And on the right and left of it are just some, some cement bins, which I have made compost in, but I mostly used them for just collecting the raw materials for the next batch of compost, so leaves and things like that. Okay, so in front of us here, we see, you know, I've got a couple of buckets of green material. That's that green leafy stuff I was shredding earlier. And, and a couple of bags of leaves. That's not all we're gonna to need to fill that bin, but it's enough to make the demonstration work. And of course, you're gonna to have to have some water on hand. So you either have buckets or it's a whole lot nicer and easier to have a hose right there. I, I really recommend doing that. Okay, so you need to have all your materials on hand. This is, this is the other compost pile that I'm gonna make with stuff that I have on hand here in Payson. So that's horse manure on the right that's been watered down a little bit and some leaves on the left. And again, we're gonna be making two piles and we're gonna be switching back and forth so you'll be able to see two different processes. It's really the same thing. Okay, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is dump a few inches, you know, two, three, four inches of browns in the bottom of your bin. You're gonna get all that in there and if you have some different kinds of browns, go ahead and mix them right in. You know, but put about two or three to four inches of stuff in the, in the bottom there and then, and, and this is doing it into the barrel. That's what it'll look like there, of course. And then you need to wet it down. So you're gonna take a hose or your sprinkler can or whatever it is you're gonna use, get it wet, and then give it a stir. You're gonna find out immediately that all the leaves did not get wet, only some of them got wet. So give it a stir, add some more water, give it a stir, add some more water. When it's uniformly damp, 
then you know that you've got the all your leaves in that layer dampened up and you're ready to move on. So then of course you're going to, oops, we're going the wrong way. Then you're going to add your, your greens and just dump those on. And again, depending on your ratio, you're going to use much less greens than you did of the browns. So in the horse manure case, it's going to be one to one. In a sheep manure case, it's going to be you know, two or three, about three to one is what I found worked. And with fresh vegetable material like this, it's probably a little bit different yet. But so you start off with about two or three to one and then fine tune it for whatever it is you're using. And then I like to just uh, take the fork and give the two layers, the first brown and the first green, I like to give it a quick stir. You don't have to do this. I'll tell you, you do not have to do this. This is all gonna get stirred up later in the process. But I like to do it now because it jump starts the process a little bit, makes it a little bit easier. And at this time, if you find that you still need a little bit more water, feel free to add some more water to make sure things are uniformly damp. Okay, so here's it is doing it in the barrel. So this is some dry, relatively dry horse manure on top of the leaves. And it needed some water, so I added a little bit of water and I gave it a stir. And if you need to add a little more water, then that's what you do. And you're going to keep on doing this, brown layer, some water, stir it a little bit, brown layer, uh, uh, add some more water, get it uniformly moist, and then you're going to add your greens again, same old thing, it's the same process, brown, green, brown, green, you're going to just keep on working all the way to the top of your pile. And you have an opportunity uh, to stir along the way, and I, I recommend stirring the most recent two layers, the, the most recent brown, the most recent green, just to get it mixed together a little bit. And if it needs a little water, feel free to do that. And then when you get to the top or near the top, you're going to top it off with a layer of brown. So just throw some dead dry brown stuff on there and give it a little bit of moisture. And then you're going to top that off with some kind of a, a top, like a, a piece of something that's breathable. So an old piece of carpet square, a piece of canvas. You can use plastic. It's not the best material because it doesn't breathe, but it will work. And this is, what, of course, what it looks like in the top of the drum. So you can put your, your carpet square or whatever on top of that. The, the, the reason for the top piece is just to reduce evaporation. And here in our dry climate, that's, that's a real important factor. Otherwise, your pile is going to dry out way too soon. and You don't want that going on. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to wait about one to two days, 24 to 48 hours, and walk out to your pile and take your hand, your outstretched hand, and stick it straight down into the pile, all the way to your wrist. So your fingers are way down in there and, you, and the pile is, you're up to it to your wrist. Your fingers should be either really warm or very hot, somewhere in that range. And we might be talking as much as 150 degrees. It can be so hot that you will not leave your hand there. It'll be so hot. And so you'll, when you've done that, once you found out that you've got some pretty good heat going in there, you'll know you've done something really right. You've got your ratio in the ballpark. You haven't overwatered it or underwatered it. And your ratio is looking pretty good. Okay. So that's, uh, that's getting the pile started. And, and I do want to mention that the heat, uh, if I haven't talked about that already, the heat of the pile has nothing to do with whether you're composting in the sun or in the shade or whether you're composting in the winter or the summer. That heat is strictly due to the bugs going about their daily lives. So we're talking eating and digesting and excreting and reproducing. And believe it or not, it's actually the reproduction that creates most of the heat. So how about that? You've got sex going on in your garden in your compost pile there. Okay, so now you got your compost going, you've got it warmed up and so you know you're doing something right. Now what we're gonna do is we're actually going to do something to maintain the pile. So what you're gonna do is on a weekly basis, you're gonna walk out to your pile, you're gonna do what I call the fist test. So you're gonna reach into the compost and you're gonna grab a fistful of compost and you're gonna squeeze it tight in your hand. And then with your palm up, you're going to open your hand. And if your pile, uh, if, your, if your ball of compost there is a, is a wet, solid ball, you know your pile's a little too dry. 
uh, sorry, it's too wet, sorry. And you're not gonna add any more water to it that week. If your, pot, if your little ball of stuff there falls apart completely immediately, you know it's too dry. So you will be adding some water that week. And if it starts to fall apart slowly or with just the slightest nudge of your finger, that's just about right. You kind of want it to be like a wrung out sponge. So I call that the fist test. And you're going to do that every week. And then you're going to stir the pile. And if you need to add water while you're stirring it, you're going to add the water. And so here I'm sort of demonstrating that compost crank thing. You're going to drill it down into the pile and pull it up and drill it down and pull it up and just move all the way around the, the barrel until you've got the whole thing done that way. Okay, so along the way, as you're going here week to week, and on any day, you can walk out there with your kitchen scraps, the greens from your kitchen, and you can throw them into the pile. Now, you don't want to throw them on top of the pile. You want to actually bury them. And they only have to be a couple inches down. Don't worry about putting them at the bottom. But you need to get them into the pile and, and cover it over and put your cover back on it and walk away. That's all you need to do when you're adding your kitchen scraps. Do not add any more browns after day one. Okay, no more browns, but you can add greens along the way. Okay, and you can do that just about as often as you want. Okay, so after about two months of this, you've been going out there every week, you've been checking the moisture with the fist test, and you've been stirring. After about two months' time, you're going to find out that the pile is not warm anymore. You can stick your hand all the way down in there, and it's, and it's not going to be warm. The process is moving along pretty nicely, but it's not done. You're also going to notice at about two months time that pretty much everything in there is unidentifiable. Unlike the guy who threw the, the banana peels and the carrot tops in his bucket, you're going to find that you can't really identify much of anything in there. The leaves are broken down, the, the manures or leaf, green leaves, whatever it was you put in there, all that stuff's going to be broken down and it should pretty much look like dirt. But the process is not done. You need to go one more month. It needs to be stretched out to three months. And during that month, you need to, once a week, you're doing the same thing. You're checking it for moisture and you're stirring it. Now what's going on during that process is you're actually getting into the, getting to the finished stage. If any of you have ever made things like cheese or beer or wine or yogurt, you know that that's a, a bug related process and you're not done until you're done. You can't just stop that process anywhere through and expect it to be right. It won't taste right. Your yogurt won't taste right and your, your beer will certainly not taste right if you stop in the middle. So you need to let the thing finish. The right group of microbes has to have worked its way through the process. When you had all that heat, all the, all the uh, bacteria that really like heat they're known as the thermophilic, the heat-loving bacteria. They're the ones that are thriving and doing their thing. They're creating all that heat. But as their food supply starts to wane, then another group, another population of that 30,000 different species of bacteria in there, another population starts to come into dominance, and it likes it to be warm, not hot. And then as, they, as their food supply starts to go away, the cool loving uh, bacteria will become dominant. And, it's, and you need to let it get through that whole process. So do let it go to three months time, even though it seems like it's done at two months. Okay, so that's, that's basically uh, what you're gonna find out. And at, at the end of that three months, again, you should not be able to really recognize anything in there except the stuff that's not gonna decompose anyway. We're talking about sticks, and rocks and candy wrappers and who knows what else you might have gotten into your pile there, you know. Okay, it also should, should look and smell like good fresh dirt, you know, nice earthy aroma to it. It should not stink. If it stinks, generally speaking, if your compost stinks, your compost stinks. It's no good. So you want to you wanna be sure that it's, that it's good stuff. And also, um, you should not really have any uh, green materials left in there unless you just added something last week. If you added something to it from your kitchen last week, almost certainly it's not decomposed yet. No big deal. You can add that to your next compost pile. 
You may also find some interesting unexpected things in your compost pile during that last month. You might find some plants growing in there. So maybe some, some zucchini is starting to grow from seeds and, and zucchini that you threw from your kitchen into there. Or you might find some worms in there, or you might find some grubs. Grubs are really nasty things to have in your garden, but they are wonderful shredders. They're really good to have in your compost. They help break things down and, do a, uh, and help all those bacteria and fungi out. They do a good job. So if you find grubs in there, save them for your next batch of, of stuff or throw them into your bag of leaves that you're storing or whatever. But if you can save them, by all means do. If you can't save them, feed them to the chickens. Chickens love them. Okay, so then what you're going to do with your compost is you're going to, uh, or what you can do next is before putting it in the garden or somewhere, is you can sift it. And again, this will help you get out some of those things that you don't want in there. So we're talking, you know, again, those sticks and rocks and grubs and things like that. So you can get those things out of there. At this point, you can do pretty much three different things with your compost. You have three basic uses for it. You can use it as a fertilizer, so you can turn it you know, well into your soil and, and, you know, and enhance the entire bed, or you could use it as a side dressing in your plants and, and you know, fertilize that way, or you can use it as a mulch. It works very well as a mulch. Or you can use it for compost tea. And again, we're really not gonna talk about compost tea, just suffice it to say that you really want to have finished compost to make compost tea. Okay, that's about what I have to say on that. I'm going to anticipate a couple of questions that you might have, and and they are some of that I often got during the spiel. I've given this talk a, a number of times, and one of the questions that people always ask is, well, gee, where am I going to get all those browns or all those greens to fill a 55-gallon fill a drum? Well, around here in the fall, if you can't find leaves, you're not looking. You can go to any of the places that have leaves. We're talking schools and parks and golf courses and RV parks in particular are very rich in leaves in the fall. All you can eat. I mean, you can get those as many as you want. All you can eat. And as far as browns are concerned, especially if you're willing to use manures, and some people are not, some people like to stay away from that, but as I said, I've had my best luck with manures. Um, manures can be had almost anywhere around here. There are so many horse people and cow people and sheep people and whatnot. If you can't find some horse manure in the Payson area, you're, you're dead. There's, it's just everywhere around here. And those people really want to get rid of that manure. So they're very welcoming of your coming to their house or to their, their ranch or whatever to get it. So it's very much available. Another question I get is, well, you know, I've heard that horse manure in particular is really bad for compost because the horses may have been fed Bermuda hay or they may have been eating Bermuda grass. And I don't want to end up with Bermuda in my garden. Well, you know, I've taught this class, as I said, many times. And I, for the first couple of years that I taught it, I, I, I said exactly that. Do not use manure from horses, especially if, if they were fed Bermuda. Well, I came to Payson. And horse manure was pretty much all I could get in big volume. And the particular place that I get my manure the horses are almost exclusively fed with Bermuda hay. So I figured with my first batch that I was gonna be playing with fire and you know this was not gonna work out and I didn't wanna do more than one garden bed because I didn't wanna risk the, you know, getting Bermuda grass in it. Well, I've been making compost here now for two years, two and a half years, and I have not yet gotten the first bit of Bermuda grass in any of my garden beds. And I've been using that horse manure exclusively. So, you know, you can, it, it makes sense that you could get Bermuda in your garden bed. And I, I have, I've talked to one guy who said that he actually had that happen. But other than that, I've not heard any first, firsthand experience where someone told me that it happened. And I know there's a guy that gardens just down the street from me, and he gardens about 10 times the size of what I do. And he gets his, all his horse manure from the same place I do. And he has had no problem. 
So anyway, with that, I can open it up to Q and A. Any uh, any questions? Rich, yes. I started um, my composting because I didn't know just after we had that pruning class, and so I had um, a huge cardboard box and I cut that down and laid that on the ground and then have just been adding stuff on top of it. I have not watered it. I have not stirred it. So I, I can see I need to take care of that. Um, I do have a bag of manure that I got at the store. Should I just put that in there? You can certainly do that. I mean, that you need to add greens of some kind. Uh, oh, I have all kinds of greens. Okay. That's uh, that's an expensive way to add manure. I mean, it's expensive at the store, so you want right. to you know, come up with another source. And, and if I, I can hook you up with a with an easy, small, quick source. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. You're welcome. This is it's Steve. A, it's a, oh, uh, behind the uh, community garden, there is a pile of horse manure. That's where I get mine. Yes, yeah. So there, there's somebody's doing the work for you. They're they're digging it up for you and, and putting it into a place. And so that's you know that's a great great place to get it. Hmm. Do you have to have a lot there or a garden plot to get to use that? No, uh, it's open to the public. Yeah, I think Thank it's you. open. It's open for anybody to dump it there, and I think anybody to take it. Thank you. Um, this is Chris. If I could uh, step in now, I believe I've got a new slide up. Um, one thing I'd like for you to do, you should have on your bar something that says participant or, or reactions, a little smiley face. And so if you can see that smiley face, it should give you a chance to give him a, an applause. There you go. Susan found it. Thumbs <laughs> up and we'd like you to do, do that if you appreciated Rich's time today. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to send out a poll at this time. And I'm just asking you if, um, how you heard about this event, whether you received an email or you saw it on Facebook, those are the two exclusive ways that we got this out this time. And I'll leave that open here so we can get some your responses on that. And I'm also going to send you a chat message that has that webinar evaluation link. And if you can go into that link, it shouldn't take very long. It just asks if you think you learned something, would you share something, and some new any ideas that you have for webinars as we go forward. So. If you've been here, if you're with us today, please go to that. It, like, it should take you three, three, four minutes max. And um, and the rest of it, Rich, people jumped in just as they were supposed to. This is an opportunity for us to have our question and, and Q&A discussion. And um, you shared some very simple ways to make composting more effective. Get the right tools, don't do it too big. Yeah, so I'm gonna stop there. If you want to talk, just unmute your, I, well, I can put, let me make sure you guys can all unmute. I think you can. <laughs> uh, Rich, this is David Linda Rose, my questioner. Um, is the manure, is that a green ingredient or a brown, the horse manure? Yeah, the manure is definitely a green. I will tell you that sometimes in the case of, of sheep manure, it's, it's dry, so you will have to add water, but it is a green. Okay, and then um, how do first need to be on birds? Can all the green pretty much be the, the horse manure and all the brown be a, a bunch of grass? Well, if we're doing a five gallon container, it's not that much stuff, you know. Or is it important to mix in a variety of different brown and green ingredients? I think I got the.
variety, I'm oh, sorry, okay. You know, using the biggest variety of material is the best thing to do because you're gonna get more and more um, nutrients getting added in. So a nutrient from this leaf is a little different from the nutrient in a different leaf or different from what you're gonna get in um, you know, some cardboard or whatever. And so getting the biggest variety is, is best. I do find that in my case, I don't use very much variety. So, but more variety is better. When you're trimming your trees and stuff and your hedges, um, are those green? Yes, if, you're, if your hedges and stuff are all alive, and I presume they would be, yeah. Then, then yeah, you're, you, all that stuff is green stuff. So a good way to, to, ask, to answer that question each time when you ask it is, does it have its color and does it have moisture in it? Yes. If that's the case, then it's a green. Okay, and what about the branches that you prune off? Well, branches will be extremely slow to break down. And so your, your three-month composting thing won't work. However, if you want to throw it in, in your compost pile, you can. But at the end, when you sift it, you're going to sift it out and throw it into your next batch. And it may take three or four or five batches for it to fully break down, but it'll eventually get there. Okay, thank you. And the more, the more chipped up you can make it, the better. The smaller the piece, the better. Okay. Hi, Rich. This is Derek Davis. I'm in Ahwatukee, and I've been composting pretty much since I got married to my German wife in 1992, uh, and she put a lot of pressure on me. Um, so we actually have a fairly big operation. I have three four-foot by four-foot by four-foot bins, which I do the, you know, fill up one bin, shift it to the next in cycles. Um, and before anything goes into the first bin, I, if it's from the garden, from the backyard, I shred it. So it's, you know, particleized. Um, but my question is related to what goes in, because we have basically never discriminated on what we put in the compost. So, that includes, you know, if we have some rotten meat from the, from the fridge, it goes in. We have steak bones, they go in. Um, we do have a small number, small oleander bush, and I've always put everything in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, never, I've never seen, of course, I don't know how to know, but I've never seen any detrimental effects from doing that and maybe because we've got you know we've got a third of an acre and I've got 40 trees and pretty much everything gets composted so the percentage is probably low do you have any comments about those alternative items going into the compost uh, yeah I do let me ask you one question how, how long is a batch does a batch take for you? well for me to get from well, I cycle through these three bins, right? Okay. And I unload the last bin once a year. And, uh, and I, I screen that and then I re-shred it uh, after I've taken it out. So I end up with a very, very fine uh, material at the end. I mean, you can't tell the difference between it and, and uh, kind of a loam. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's in there for a longer cycle. It's certainly not your three month cycle that you, you are talking about here. Okay, and, and I'll ask one more question. How often do you, do you turn it from one bin to the next? Uh, well, basically, I guess it would be once a year because goes into, the, I fill up this, this four by four by four bin constantly until it's full. And at that point, when I have no more room, I go to the third bin and I empty it. And then I shift the second bin to the third bin and I shift the first bin to the second bin. And now I have an empty first bin that I can start the process again. Okay. So it's about once a year. 
Okay. So what's going on in a case like that is you, you probably have more anaerobic conditions going on, especially at the bottom of the bin. Yeah. And you have to realize that, you know, nature breaks down everything. You know, it breaks mm -hmm. down meat and bones and all the stuff. I mean, it all ends up, you know, in the, in the ground eventually anyhow. Right. Right. Um, the thing that you want to avoid when you're trying to do my three month process is not transferring some of the bad bugs. You know, one of, one of the neat things about bugs, especially we're talking about bacteria, is that bacteria subscribe to the 90-10 rule. 90% of the bugs are either harmless or, or helpful to man. Only 10% of them are bad. And so you just want to kind of avoid the possibility of getting that 10%. Now, when you're doing a long compost thing like you're doing, then putting in that other stuff is fine. Good. And I've talked to other people who do oleander and, you know, against my advice and, and they do just fine, but they probably do a longer process. Right. So I think you're doing just fine. Okay. Okay. Rich and Derek, if I could add, um, when, when we do this, the two things we say stay away from are your dog and cat poop because mm. it can have community oh, yeah. diseases with us and, and wood ash because ash can make our soils even more alkaline than they already are. And, but, you know, I think Rich gave you very good advice there. So thanks for the question. Glad you're with us. Thanks. For, thank you, Rich. And people are doing this just right. You're unmuting yourself for a question. Um, floor is still, Rich is still on the floor. <laughs> so is everybody ready to, to do their first batch of uh, big compost? Uh, I had a question. We we uh, had a batch that we threw out. We had so many grubs. There were more grubs than there was anything else in there. And uh, what size screen would you use to get rid of grubs? Is quarter inch small enough or would you have to go smaller than that? Quarter inch should be fine. You know, that should get out almost all the grubs. Most of the ones I find certainly would be bigger than that. So Rich, according to what Derek just said, you screen, you sift all of this stuff through a screen? This is after you're done. When the compost is done, and you don't have to do this. I started off doing it, but I ended up, what I did was along the way as I was stirring every week, you know, like you have to do, you go out there and you stir it. When I found things that I didn't want in there, I would pull them out. So when I find oh, okay. a bunch of sticks in there, I yank them out. So by the time the end of the three months is up, I found that I didn't really have that much bad stuff in there. And what I mean by bad is the stuff that, you know, is not going to decompose anyway. And, okay. and so if you, you want to sift it, you can do it at that point, but you don't have to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you everybody for responding to that poll. Um, it seems like most of you got the email blast from me the other day. So, wow. Thank you. I'm trying to get that out through um, Facebook, but just got this started, trying to learn new ways to be able to um, share this information. Um, we've got a website we call the University of Arizona Gila County Cooperative Extension. If you can um, like that page, you can be sure that it's on there. Um, we've also got some other pages say Gila County Master Gardeners that we can share this through. I did send you a chat message. Oh, people have been chatting to me here. We have not been paying attention. Okay, you know, they just got back to me saying they're doing it and Dave and Linda said fantastic webinar. That's really kind. Yeah, so that I think you're going to be able to have the best chance to get at that webinar, that evaluation that way. Let me see if I can advance the screen here. Hmm. What are, you, what are you seeing? Black right now? Black. 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 Why don't you get to the last page here for us? Oh, there we go. You still have the poll thing on there. Oh, really? In the center of the screen. But you can't get to it. Yeah, I can't get to move it. that poll out. Is that on your screen or on my screen? Mine. Okay. No, actually, it's, it's, it's your screen. 
Is there a box that exit out? Because I have it turned off. There is, but I can't, my mouse won't do anything here. It won't let you do anything. Our mouse won't work on your screen. But, hmm. <laughs> um, let me do a stop share. Did that get rid of it? No. Yeah, now you're I, there. I don't think it's on my screen. I think it's on your screen. Okay, now now it is, and now I can exit out. Okay, I'm gonna bring up that that last slide again. Come up. Well, if you can see this, we're we're good. <laughs> so, so um, why isn't that coming up? So our next webinar will be next Thursday at 11. I've got Kevin McCulley, who is the fuels manager for the Payson Fire Department, lined up. He's going to talk to us about wildfire preparedness program they call Ready, Set, Go. And <coughs> this is important to participate in regardless of where you live in, in Gila County. Some of us think we're in a lower elevation, Tahoe Basin or Globe Miami, and think we don't have a threat for wildfire, but um, <laughs> the uh, Woodbury fire last year took all of that away. Um, so that's going to be a useful talk. Um, just verbally here, I'm going to get it on this website here. You can watch this um, recorded, the archive recording here and learn more about uh, the extension program here at this website. Um, we're going to be talking about the grass that moved in to Tano Basin and now in the Payson area, in the Globe area called Red Brome. And it's kind of new grass helping to carry wildfires. So new things we can do about that, but really not a nice grass. Anyway, it's here now. Um, another thing that's interesting is use of biochar. So um, particularly up in the Payson area, being able to burn the wood. We can burn wood down here too. It breaks down and there are certain con conditions is something we call biochar as opposed to charcoal and that can be used as a soil amendment. So I've got two presentations, one to talk about that and another one about how to create a biochar kiln to be able to do that work. And, and so I'll be having that information online. And so I've got June kind of planned out and be looking for presentations starting in July that I can, can include. So I want to thank everybody for your time today. Um, again, we can thank Rich for his time and uh, definitely want to stop in these before the hour is over. So does anybody have anything else they want to share at this time before I, we take off? In the in the chat, I added a question if you could add me to your email distribution. I went to your site literally five minutes before the login time to find out how to ask a question about a fungus in my yard. <laughs> and then I discovered this this webinar. As By a utter result. chance. Wow. Utter, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like like a five minute window or so. Anyway, so if you could add me to your distribution, that would be great. I've got you, Derek. I'll put you in the in my listserv. Thanks. Chris, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear a voice. This is Jeannie Putnam. Oh, Jeannie. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm wonderful. And I'm like Derek. I just was checking for another email, and there you were. I didn't know you were doing these, but I'm so happy to find you. Well, this is the first this is the debut. Yes. <laughs> I'm in Phoenix now, but I'm going to check out every one of your webinars. It's so good to touch in again. It's great to hear your voice and know you're well. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for your time today. I'm going to go ahead and um, stop the share here. We've already did that and I'll... <laughs> This is Jeannie one more time, yeah, and I'm still gardening like crazy. My garden now is around the swimming pool in containers because I'm in a wheelchair now. So that's my garden, and I've only fallen in the pool twice. <laughs> <laughs> wow.
I'm glad you can get out. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. I have so many things growing down here, so I'll, I'll always be gardening, so thank you. Thank you. Well, this concludes our um, first webinar, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you.